Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Karen Dirksen, and I'm the director of Winthrop University Galleries. So tonight we're here to welcome Stephanie Sutton, who is our assistant professor of art at Winthrop and specializing in photography and time-based media. Through the critical lens of feminist theory, identity politics, and medical pathologies, her performances for the camera employ conventions of labor and ritual to complicate assumptions of discipline and destabilize virtues of self-control. The subject of several invitational shows, Stephanie's work is recognized for success in transgressing the limits of the isolated subject and redirecting self-consciousness onto the viewer. Stephanie earned her MFA from the Larmer Dodd School of Art at the University of Georgia and her BFA in Studio Art from the Ernest G. Welch School of Art and Design at Georgia State University. And we really welcome you here tonight, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, I want to thank Karen uh, first for putting on the faculty show. It's great not only to be in the company of Ava and Elizabeth and Miles um, as new faculty. Shout out Mikhail and Kyle Sweeney too. Yes. Um, but also um, we'll see them. <laughs> yeah, we'll see them in other iterations. That's right. um, but also just to be in the same space as, as those folks work. Um, it's really interesting, I think, to see design and illustration uh, neon and uh, in this case video projection and see sort of how those things speak to each other which traditionally don't. So I'm going to share my screen. Me and Karen have practiced this what like three times now <laughs> and we're going to hope that I get it right. Karen, does everything look okay? I can't see you, but if I could hear from you. Yes, it all looks good to okay. me. Yeah. Good deal. Okay, so um, I'm going to begin by talking about music videos, which is the work that is uh, found in the gallery right now. Um, and then I'm going to backtrack a little bit and go to some earlier projects that speak to similar investigations and themes that will help explain some of the context at which music videos came about and some of the uh, questions as they've evolved through my research. Um, and hopefully, uh, if we have enough time at the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about where my work is going and um, hopefully you can see some similar visual language um, and a clear trajectory at that point. So um, most of my practice is considered performance for camera. Um, and that specifically is a title that I like to identify my work with because unlike a live performer, um, my work is really concerned with the construction of an environment, of an action, um, of a question with the camera in mind. So the audience is something that I am very sensitive to, but the mediation of the camera lens, the computer screen, all of that is, uh, is quite central in my work. So I'll talk a little bit later about how my particular body type functions as a subject. Um, but my work is always concerned and asking questions about how we see ourselves and what our reflections can tell us about a subjective human experience. So I'm curious, what does it mean to experience the space around our bodies? And how do the physical characteristics of our bodies influence and perhaps reflect our psychological experience of being present. So the optimal installation for music videos is in a darkened space. This is an iteration of its original exhibition um, in the Margie West Gallery. And as you enter into those doors, you hopefully the doors will shut behind you. In fact, they're very big and very heavy and very loud as they slam behind you. Um, and you are entered in a very large room that's completely darkened and the video is shown in three channels on projectors that are um, significantly taller than you. And I detail this out for you because I hope that you can recognize that the footage as it's being shown 
along with some pretty strategic sound speaker placement, um, is all designed to direct your body to pivot and to be aware of the volume of the space that you're in, um, but also sort of where you are in relation to the footage or to the performer in this case. Um, the videos for music video never really overlap or play simultaneously. Um, and the version that is in the Rutledge Gallery or the, um, the gallery upstairs in Rutledge, uh, that's a single channel version of the original uh, video installation. And that is giving you um, a one channel experience um, of otherwise a real a bodily immersive experience. Another iteration of that same piece is seen here. This is at OCAF Gallery in Watkinsville, Georgia. Um, and depending on the circumstance of the room depends on you know, how immersive or how intimate I can direct that experience for the viewer. So unlike the first version, which is all about sort of the volume of space and the loudness of an echo of a door hitting behind you as you're alone with the video, um, this one plays on the idea of a peep show, which would be a booth that you would go in by yourself, you would pay to go in, and then a performer, probably an adult dancer, would be um, unveiled behind some sort of curtain, and they would dance specifically for you. So in this iteration, I was thinking more about what it meant to be alone with the video, what it meant to be um, in close proximity and maybe what it even meant to build tension on the fact that something is so small and close. So um, before I go into great detail, I do want to just show an excerpt of the video. It's an 11 minute video installation um, that's on loop in the galleries uh, at Rutledge there. But this is going to be an abridged version that um, I hope that you will understand the way that it's cut is for is for time. So as a performer for the camera, um, the missing live audience can often be the elephant in the room or seemingly the largest void um, that is not being addressed. So instead of really working around that, my research tries to lean into the concept of an obscured relationship between the audience and performer. Um, and I want it to sort of speak directly to that space between, again, thinking about the way that the screen is mediating or disconnecting um, between me and the me as the performer and you as the audience. Um, and I've noticed that for musicians, they've really embraced the circumstance of not performing live to their audience, and they package uh, an intimate experience to try and recreate that connection that they might on stage in the form of music videos. So this video installation, um, or this video that I just showed you here, an excerpt of is doubling down on some of the conventions of the music video genre. I want you to consider strategies from music videos um, and I'm trying to use those to hold your attention and bridge that space between me and you. So some of the tropes that I've identified to be repeated and successful um, at constructing intimacy are first of all, eye contact. So performers will often sing directly into the camera in the constructed spaces they're performing in. And even if there's a live audience being filmed as part of the video, they often will gaze directly into the camera. They're singing directly to us, their viewer. So despite whether you, wherever you are, uh, whether you're watching on a television or you're watching on your phone, um, you are not in physical space with their body, but they're singing to you. It's also suggesting a very solitary viewing experience. So like I mentioned before about going into a room and the door shutting behind you or being confined into a peep show booth, uh, music videos are really intended for a single viewing experience, um, or at least they think they originally were. They may have changed just a little bit. But as you can see, I'm looking at a real specific age of music videos. And of course, this is the time when I'm a teenager and in my early 20s when these um, images were the most impressionable. So the fantasy of the view of the performer singing to us in the audience as individuals is 
only aided by the fact that they're probably singing about love, right? So those lyrics are building on this fantasy that I and the performer are uh, in some sort of connection. Also, the presence of the body is usually very front and center in the image. Um, and this helps further a narrative of physical intimacy or even sex. But that's not without political power as well. So seen here in some of my favorite videos, um, and not only favorite ones for their technical achievements, namely the D'Angelo untitled, How Does It Feel, which is a masterpiece, um, but also for really representing underrepresented bodies. So when Missy Elliott arrived on the scene, it was really during the onslaught of male-dominated hip-hop. So we were suddenly shown a woman of color, um, and she's insisting on our attention by shoving through the frame. And when I say the frame, I mean this very exaggerated corner constructed space in a suit that further exaggerates her body. And there's just no mistaking that uh, she's demanding to be seen here. And then in the Bjork video, All is Full of Love, if you can recall, we find that the two robots that are um, in love, spoiler alert, um, the faces of both of those robots are Bjork's face. And then suturing together the video montages of myself in music videos, um, there are silent interludes that show equipment found in a traditional lighting studio. So things like strobe lights and ring flashes. And now I don't think ring flashes are really a novelty because of uh, TikTok and Snapchat. But for a while, everybody wondered where that perfect reflection of light in Missy Elliott's sunglasses came from. Um, and the ring flash became really synonymous with hip hop music videos, usually shot in a uh, tight corner with a very wide fisheye lens. Um, and then also recognizing the mylar, um, the shiny artifact of that in a portrait studio. So I'm thinking a lot about image production and the awareness that we might have for constructing our own images um, as performers or as people. Um, and it's reminding us of the limit or the uh, artifice of our own sort of personal reflections. So in this video, um, and I don't mean this one specifically, but the installation as a whole, the methods of engagement we saw in D'Angelo and Bjork's videos are ways of conflating the space between the spectator and the body on the other side of the screen. So these strategies, along with a darkened gallery room and careful sound editing, are some of the ways that I was exploring what it means to long for a connection or seek companionship. And in this video, I find that connection through my own reflection. So this research is driven by curiosity for ways in which cameras define or discover, um, and sometimes even heighten the way that we see ourselves. So in the studio, I pivot between the roles of performer, image maker, and spectator to understand alienation and how we perceive isolation in all of those roles. So I'll often construct and position myself within isolated environments to try and understand what it means to share your own company. So with those ideas, I'd like to unpack a little bit of early work to show examples of how those same questions on time and space and connection have been evolving over time, space, and connections. So in this series exercise, um, I explored time as a photographic medium. I was curious about what change looked like, how we could measure effort, and when it came to the body, what defines a real boundary or capability, a limitation. Um, and at what moment a skill might be learned or a challenge conquered. So you can see here that this is just a uh, before and after of my hair drying. This here on the left is a long exposure, um, which means that the camera shutter was open for the duration of, in this case, a stand on this mound. Most of the images in this series are shot on a large format 4x5 camera, and that's a really big camera, and I make that distinction only to say that if you've ever sort of been in the presence of one of those cameras, you recognize that there's a certain bodiness to it, that there is a, um, another figure in the room when you are in one with a 4x5 on a tripod. So for this case, uh, the 
camera really acted as my witness. It's the only thing that really knows how long I stood out there. Um, and in this case, it was 45 minutes. But you don't really know that other than me telling you. But my camera knows that. And um, that other witness to the event became something that I was really interested in. This is another long exposure, but I simply am moving in the frame. And in this case, it's a one hour exposure. So these are 15 minute intervals. Um, and to work on those very simple tasks that were just a testament to my commitment to enduring time, very simple activities, I still needed to build up stamina for those. And so here, these are some more, um, that's a long exposure on the left. And I'm squeezing ice, which is often a tool to build pain tolerance. This is prescribed mostly to women that are preparing for natural childbirth. And on the right, I am counting rice, which is um, part of the Marina Abramovich method on practicing tedium. So in the exercise work, I was thinking of very simple activities shown over time and hoping for that moment of transformation to be caught on film. Um, but I wanted to prove my discipline for enduring those things um, with something a little bit more dramatic. So for this series or this performance in Surmount, I did a live streamed performance. So this is a four and a half walk around a circle. And I wanted to put my body in motion um, to just up the stakes a little bit and hopefully that if there was a limit that I would have reached or if I would have, you know, quote unquote, failed the attempt. I was hoping that that would have been more obvious when shown a with a live audience there, but also just in action. So the performance um, uses a live audience and was streamed online. And this not only helped motivate me to complete my goal, but to be honest, I had really hoped to find that physical limit to fail um, with them watching. Um, and I wanted as big of an audience as possible, so I created a promotional campaign to build pressure on myself and hype it up for the audience. And people that were watching were able to um, chat live together and either, I wasn't told what they were saying, but they were either allowed to encourage or discourage what they were seeing. So this is open to the public, but also hopefully anonymous people were coming through and stumbling on this weird live streaming event. The four and a half hours it took to complete the walk were determined by the number of set, the number of steps I set out to walk. And in this case, it was 29,029. That number comes from uh, my fascination with Mount Everest. So Mount Everest stands at 29,029 feet above sea level. And uh, I had promoted this event as a way to come see Stephanie hike Mount Everest from her backyard. I wanted people to see me summit um, in this way. And the reason why that Mount Everest was really important to me, um, I later discovered, was that Mount Everest is the uh, in undisputed top of the world. Like the, the when you hit the peak of Mount Everest, while it is a, a bigger area than maybe you imagine, there is no disputing that you have reached that point, right? Um, and a goal like that, a very objective goal, was really appealing to me. Um, and I later sort of likened that need for objectivity when thinking about the very subjective goals of weight loss and how never really understanding when that transformation happened and never really understanding when that boundary had been transgressed or never really understanding why the effort to do something wasn't reflected in the image of the thing. So the idea of climbing Mount Everest is satisfies all of that, right? Um, so for those that are interested, this, this circle here is 29 of my steps. And so I had to complete 1,001 laps. Um, viewers could tune in anytime during the four and a half hour walk and watch the uh, physical pursuit of a goal. But unlike an athlete in a sporting game, the player on the screen did not look like an athlete. Particularly for strangers stumbling across the feed, the fat body can be a surprising subject. Even for viewers who are familiar with my body type, to see it successfully engage with an activity that demanded discipline and endurance, this would hopefully help complicate their assumptions on the fat body. And 
what was left after, of course, is this circular mark in the earth um, that I completed the 1001 laps and it, it really wasn't that dramatic after all. Um, I'm going to be brief through here because we're running a little bit low on time. This is the salt work series. This is a salt block that I am licking. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more there that I'm breezing over. This is a salt mandala. Um, mandalas are, you know, tradi traditionally practiced by Tibetan um, Tibetan practitioners with uh, colored sand. Um, and here I'm using table salt. Um, the combined performances of the two different um, scenes here, which to explain a little bit on the right hand side, the salt mandala is two different perspectives. One is from a wide shot outside of the table, um, and that was a six hour performance. And the other shot you're seeing here is from my forehead uh, with a GoPro. So this is sort of my adventure of continuing thinking about mountaineering and needlessly difficult tasks. Um, and practicing or proving my ability to be disciplined with tedium. So I use salt as a medium in salt works. Um, my interest in salt before became really about its manifestation of effort, thinking about sweat and thinking about crystallized um, salt being the crystallized form of that. So again, trying to make visible what otherwise would be a very invisible energy or making objective what would otherwise be a very subjective goal. And I hope here that you're starting to recognize the metaphor that all of these things have with uh, the need to lose weight or the perceived need to lose weight. Um, those ideas kind of came to head um, in heavy set. This is an installation view. I make note of it because, again, I want you to recognize that as you enter into the room, you are surrounded by videos and how I'm directing your gaze is also directing your body to be moving in that space. And hopefully that self-consciousness that I'm showing you through the videos is coming across in your own bodily experience of witnessing those. Also, you'll notice that the projectors are on the bottom here, which means that if you were to stand in front of them, which most people did, your own shadow would then be projected and you yourself would be implied within that space. So I'm going to break down some of the vignettes that we're looking at. Um, and these play, unlike music videos, which never really overlap, the videos in heavy set sometimes do overlap and it's all very choreographed to the sound that you're hearing that's coming out of different speakers in the room but recognize that some of these things like I said would be designed to sort of direct your gaze uh, maybe over your own shoulder. So the video on the left is Abundant Woman um, and this is depicting a clementine tree as it's weighed down from the uh, weight of its fruit. And here we sort of recognize the tree at full bounty. It's living its best life, right? It is um, at its heightened sort of purpose. And of course, that means that it's bearing a lot of weight. And I was really struck by that sort of double standard, right? Like we can look at uh, a natural phenomenon of abundance and we can recognize it as bountiful and we can recognize it as um, nourished. But when we think of people, of course, um, we have, at least in Western culture, we have very different ideas of what excess means. Um, and I paired that alongside the video on the right here, which um, is showing a headless horse as I am um, dismounting from it. And I slowed that footage down of the dismount to really exaggerate the weight, the pull of gravity as I fell off of the horse. And again, thinking about how we compare our bodies to animals and how we have to discipline them and we have to feed them at certain times and we have to ignore their hunger. But if an animal were to be hungry, of course, it would have the free liberation to um, serve its own body. So the symbol symbolic act of nurturing uh, surrenders the idea here of taming the wild body and simultaneously an expression of physical relationships that are mediated and phenomenologically possible because of the body. 
Another vignette in that series is movements. And here um, you listen to a robotic audio recording that is describing gestures, the appearance of gestures that are signature to the fat body. Um, so some of the examples of what is being said over the speaker is thighs make swishing sound when they rub together. Ankles roll inward, but jiggles. Food can be a really productive visual tool when telling the story of the fat experience. Um, in terms of perception, overeating is the ex expectation about the fat body that I can depend on viewers to come with them um, arms with into the installation. So here I'm utilizing food as another performative gesture. Um, and the food items here selected are not arbitrary. These are directly talking to um, the image of eating, drinking, and licking that we sent to outer space as part of the Voyager Golden Record. So this is what we tell aliens is what it looks like for a human being to eat. Um, so here I'm, I'm doing that. And that all kind of comes to head um, in the climax of the installation. Um, this is Grass Piece, which is the only video that is always playing during the entire installation. And it sort of acts as a progress bar because we know when it's finished, right? We know the object of the goal of cutting grass. So here I'm thinking again about manicure and maintenance and things that are otherwise um, incorrectly discriminated against the fat body. Um, and this video and the whole installation closes as I come to finish the video, like I said here, as I finish cutting the grass. And you recognize that because as I'm approaching the camera, you'll hear my labored breath. And if I have time, I'm going to show that. Um, and I'm not going to describe this. Instead, I think what I'll do is show you how those things sort of come together. And we're going to pray that I can figure this out. Let me know if y'all don't hear sound. Guys, make, make audible, audible swishing, swishing sound, sound as, as they, they rub, rub together. together. But jiggles. But jiggles. Arms, Arms extend wide around, around hips, hips versus, versus swinging, swinging straight, straight down. down. Clothing, Clothing gets stuck, stuck in folds between, between thighs, thighs stomach, stomach, and, and arms. arms. So I hope that you can see how collectively uh, the installation showcases the fat body for its hypervisual ability to express pleasure and nourishment. Um, and I want this to sort of argue for the political power of the fat subject and how well it particularly rejects the notion that bodies are only valuable when expressing restraint. It's an expression instead of uh, non-compliance. It's a model for these things and the boundaries and limits and thresholds and in some cases the failures that I had hoped to uh, show in my earlier performances. This work really aims to transgress those limits instead of defining them or to um, recognize their 
how the plurality of subjectivity is really um, more interesting, frankly, than proving discipline. So music videos followed behind this work as I continue to pursue ideas about desire and self-image and the role that music will come to serve in my performance work. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to mention that um, you'll notice that I slip between speaking in third person, first person, and that of the viewer. Um, and I make note of this because as a performer for camera, um, there's some really slippery roles that are happening. And I've noticed that when I, um, I'm noticing that my perspective, my sense of self is really um, at its most vulnerable, but also at its most capable time of changing or evolving. Um, I'm noticing that that happens when I'm able to do that pivot when I'm really able to step outside of being the performer, being the subject, and wait and sit on some footage and then watch it for the first time. It's only then that I recognize objectively outside of my body um, that my subject experience is quite cloudy, right? It's quite um, critical of its own self. So that need to prove and that need to define, that need to show discipline um, is not of interest to the editor in me or into the viewer of me. So the beauty of performance for the camera really is that ability to mediate that screen that's between us because what it allows me to do is not only use strategies of light and artifice to connect to you but it also allows me to be you it allows me to um, change my own perspective on the world um, while hopefully demonstrating modeling uh, versions of that on my side I want to just spend the last few minutes that I have here to talk about some work that I am in the progress of making. I don't usually show work in progress. Um, and in fact, I haven't really shown it to very many people at all. So I just want to let you kind of know how I'm leaving music videos and thinking instead about well, not instead, but thinking about those same ideas of the screen and how we see ourselves. But I'm naturally going to be influenced by the world that I'm in. And in this case, the world of Zoom and TikTok are um, quite consuming to me. I'm sure you're, you as well, we're sitting here talking um, right now through it. Um, but I'm curious about what it means that what's, what in our human nature makes it where when we're talking on Zoom to others, we are more drawn to our own camera. What about that sort of uh, self-consumption, what does that say about us? And I also am curious about with us being in quarantine and not having other people to really um, talk to, if we are still thinking of the isolated subject, talking to ourselves, what does it mean when we don't have anything to say? So um, I'm going to just show a couple of minutes. This is a mashup of a few different pieces that I'm working on. Um, I've laid some music down to kind of blend them together, but recognize that they will probably eventually find forms that are not together. And I hope that you will see that they share a visual language that the um, other pieces have sort of set up for you. Okay, I think I'll end there. Wonderful. Look at that she's time, Karen. Six forty-five. Right <laughs> brilliant. I was like, she keeps talking about the time she's got around it. It's it's great. It's perfect. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's nice to see some of your other work as well. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Miles is commenting. That's exciting. New work. Do you ever collaborate with artists working in different mediums? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I don't. Um, I took a collaborations class in grad school once and I found myself there on total accident. I was told it was a performance for camera class and I showed up the first day and somehow my enrollment had got messed up and I was in a collaborations class and it pained me because it was, it worked so against, you know, the ideas and my method. So I learned a lot. And what I learned in that class mostly was that collaborations are really a smart business model because of their like built in accountability, right? Like it's not just